Constantine was born in 274 AD of a heathen nobleman Chlorus and his peasant concubine Helena. From his youth he showed unusual valor in battle and at the death of his father in England he was declared Caesar in the year 306 AD. At the time he worshipped Apollo, the god of the sun. Upon being named emperor, the young general then marched his troops toward Rome, where he hoped to dislodge his rival Maxentius and take possession of the imperial throne. As he drew near the critical encounter at Milvian Bridge, Constantine saw a vision which he never forgot. He saw a cross standing over the sun and heard a heavenly voice instructing him to, in this sign, conquer. Obeying the heavenly vision, he gave order that the name Christ was to be painted on the shields of his men. Having done so, he marched toward the battle, confident that the God of the Christians would bless him with victory, which he did. From that day on, Constantine would venerate Christ, though not formally convert to his religion, till near his death some 25 years later. Having consolidated his civil power, becoming the sole emperor of the Western Empire, uh, Constantine was quick to legalize Christianity and began endowing the church with many royal favors, only a few of which I can presently mention. Firstly, Sunday was declared the Christian Sabbath, as a result of which work was forbidden and church attendance encouraged. Second, Pagans were generally removed from their government posts and replaced with Christians. Third, pastors were relieved of military obligation and given a tax-exempt status. Fourth, pastors became the salaried employees of the state, paid by the taxes levied on Christian and pagan alike. And lastly, Christian buildings were erected, enlarged, and richly furnished throughout the empire. As might be expected, the church was deeply grateful to the emperor. Indeed, she was too grateful. For in accepting his favors, they were inadvertently submitting to his sovereignty. After all, whoever pays the piper calls the tune. The evils produced by this illicit union cannot be exaggerated no matter how well-intentioned Constantine or the church leaders of the time may have been. The latter in particular acted with inexcusable stupidity and pride. The immediate effects of the legalization of Christianity and the joining of the church and the state in an unholy affair were, in a word, disastrous. Two things in particular occurred when the church and state came into union. First of all, it became fashionable to be a Christian, and therefore worldly men motivated by self-interest joined the church. Augustine complained that the church fills itself daily with those who sought Jesus, not for Jesus, but for worldly gain. Worldliness was, alas, not confined to any sect in the church, but the church in general suffered from it. The rich lived in the most decadent luxury without a thought of their poor brethren. Gregory of Nazianzen described their behavior like this. We repose in splendor on high and sumptuous cushions upon the most exquisite covers which one is almost afraid to touch and are vexed if we but hear the voice of a moaning pauper. The rich, therefore, were rich, aristocratic, and indifferent toward the needs of their brethren. You should not, however, put the poor in any better light, for vice, of course, is no respecter of persons. The poor at the time generally entertained themselves in rioting and murder. Frequently, a bishop one pastor would stir up the mob of, quote, Christians against another bishop. They would go to his town, they would riot, they'd pull him out of his house, and they'd beat him to death. So this was the condition the church came down to after Constantine united the church and state. It became fashionable to be a Christian, 
and therefore everybody converted to the faith without so much as any change wrought by the Holy Ghost. Secondly, pastors became distant and authoritarian. Under the original order, of course, a pastor or pastors would oversee one particular church, usually not a very large body of people, and therefore they might know and be able to gently lead their people. However, under the Constantinian scheme, aristocratic men were appointed as what they called metropolitans, and they became bishops or pastors not over individual congregations, but over whole cities. And therefore, they were charged with, they were charged with the spiritual oversight of tens if not hundreds of thousands of members. Needless to say, this was utterly impossible. The pastors, therefore, were nothing more than a figurehead. Someone the people might see on the Lord's Day, never see on any other occasion. And, of course, it's awfully difficult to gently and by moral suasion lead tens or hundreds of thousands of people. So they had to adopt the typical political and military ways of leading people. And so the pastors became distant. They became authoritarian. They became unknown to their people. And they began ruling their churches much like Oriental despots ruled their nations in a cruel, heavy-handed, faultless, self-aggrandizing way. So needless to say, this was disastrous for the flock which Christ purchased with his own blood. And then thirdly, and most importantly, the state began exercising its control of the church. Constantine, the supposed friend of Christ, soon showed himself to be a Judas, For not long after he legalized Christianity, this man had the unmitigated gall to declare himself head of the church. What's worse, however, is this. The bishops of the established church agreed with his assessment and therefore denied the crown rights which belonged to Jesus Christ alone. As head of the church, naturally, The emperor could do many things, could meddle in spiritual affairs, and often did so in the most carnal fashion. What could he do? I should note in the first place that the emperor took upon himself the right to decree orthodoxy. Or to put that in a more simple way, he began to say what truth is and what error is. Therein, departing from the ancient order which said, Only Scripture determines truth and error. Only the Holy Spirit is the final arbiter on all moral questions. But in becoming the head of the church, Constantine expelled the Holy Spirit, laid aside the Scripture, and began personally decreeing orthodoxy. Now sometimes, admittedly, this worked for the cause of Christ. At Constantine's behest, for example, a council met at Nicaea in the year 325 to decide the controversy between Arius and Athanasius. In brief, Arius believed that Christ is not God. He believed that he was a good man. He believed that he was a unique messenger of God. He believed that there was no man more worthy of our imitation than Christ But in the final analysis, said Arius, Christ is not God. That's what he believed, and that's what he taught, and his views seeped throughout the Roman Empire, and by the time the council was called in 325, many hundreds of thousands of professed Christians held to this ungodly creed. Athanasius, on the other hand, who was the archdeacon of a church in Alexandria, Egypt, denied the views of Arius and made the famous statement that Christ is very God of very God and very man of very man. That Christ is more than a mere messenger of Jehovah. He is Jehovah. He's more than worthy of our imitation. He deserves our worship and veneration. And so on this particular question, of course, Athanasius was in the right, Arius was in the wrong. 
Well, this was a big controversy. It was splitting up churches. It was dividing the professed followers of Christ into different camps. And indeed, the people were so carnal at the time that often the Athanasians rioted in Aryan cities. And the Aryans rioted in Athanasian cities. And so the whole welfare of the empire, no less the kingdom of God, was at stake in once and for all determining this question. Well, Constantine called for a council. It met in Nicaea, and there Arius was first given the floor. And being a very learned and eloquent man, as well as, as well as capped with a long mane of white hair, he made for a very impressive figure. And he nearly talked the emperor into adopting his views. Athanasius, though, came up afterwards and made an even better presentation. It was amazing at the time, most of the people of that council were Aryan in nature. Athanasius then made his famous statement when someone asked him, Well, Athanasius, you're the only one in the world who's holding to this doctrine. A bit of hyperbole, but still relatively true. He made the famous statement, Well, if that's so, then Athanasius contra mundum. Athanasius will stand against the world. Well, this was so powerfully impressive to the emperor that he decided that indeed in the long run we ought to adopt the views of Athanasius and therefore Arius who denied the deity of Christ was branded a heretic he was excommunicated and sent into exile so sometimes the imperial power came alongside and furthered the kingdom of Christ but this does not validate the principle behind it for later through political intrigue, Arius once again found favor with the emperor, who was about to pardon him, recognize his views, and depose Athanasius. So, if right and wrong is a matter of royal favor, then he who can convince an emperor of one thing might come along later and convince him of quite another thing. And so, the day was set on which Arius would be pardoned, his views would be accepted, and the true cause of Christ would be exiled. But interestingly, on the very day that Arius was to be pardoned, God struck him with a deadly intestinal disease. And that very day, on the way to his pardon, he vomited up his intestines. And so awe-inspiring and so singular was this providence that all the followers of Athanasius linked him to Judas, who, falling headlong, burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. And so the emperor was called upon to decree orthodoxy. That's a bad principle. For the final arbiter of right and wrong can never be a mere man, it is always the Holy Spirit as he speaks the mind of God in the Scripture. Now, to allow Constantine to declare orthodoxy is all the more amazing when you consider what a wicked man he was. I have several things to say about the man's character which obviously disqualify him from even daring to comment on moral and ethical matters, no less decree them. First of all, in declaring Sunday to be the Christian Sabbath, he did so for two reasons. One, Christ rose from the dead that day. And two, he did it in remembrance of the Son God, after whom the Sunday was named. He never entirely departed from the worship of Apollo. And so he said, let's all take this day off because Christ rose from the dead that day and this is the day that my God, the Son, appears. He also believed that the only way to be saved was through the baptismal waters. He believed baptism washed away sin and therefore, instead of being baptized upon his profession of faith in the year 312, he was baptized in the year 337, literally on his deathbed, hoping that its baptismal waters would wash him clean in the presence of God. Later in life, he murdered his wife and two children. And to the day of his death, he kept the title not only Emperor of the Empire, but also Pontifex Maximus, High Priest of the Roman Cult. So this is remarkable, isn't it? That a man who worshipped the Son 
who murdered his own family and declared himself to be the high priest of the worship of ancient Rome would be put in the place of determining for Christians in every following generation what's true and what's untrue. But the moment the state comes into the church, the moment we mix the world in with the kingdom, you will inevitably have just that result. So that's the first thing he was allowed to do, invited to do, decree orthodoxy. Secondly, closely related to it, is he was given the right to punish heretics. Now that the state owns the sword, in, uh, or the state has a right to the sword, cannot be denied. The state is appointed by God to punish criminals, not to harass heretics. But of course, being head of the church, Constantine took upon himself the right to do the latter as well as the former. During his life, the most significant schism in the in the Christian church was the group called the Donatists. This was an African sect which keenly felt the emperor's wrath. Do you know for what heinous errors they were punished? These were the awful things that deserved the punishment of the state. One, they denied the exercise of civil power in the church. Their motto was, what has the emperor to do with the church? That's what they were punished for. They said Christ is the head of the church, not the emperor. And they didn't say, therefore, let us do whatever we please. Let us eat our children. Let us commit plunder. All they said is, leave us alone we come into the assembly. But for such things, the emperor thought it necessary to punish them. And the other thing for which they were especially marked and which separated them from the Catholics of the time was this. The Donatists demanded holiness of life as a qualification for church membership. You must be more than a professor of faith. You must be more than a baptized person. You, in order to join the church, you must live holily. During the persecutions, which just preceded the rise of Constantine, of course, many so-called Christians denied the faith, recanted what they had previously believed, and become pagans, declaring Caesar as Lord in such things. Well, when it became fashionable to be a Christian, a lot of these folks just switched right back to the church. They said, well, we want to go back to church. Of course we're Christians. We've always believed in Christ. We've been baptized and so forth. The Donatists said, no way. Christianity is not a matter of the lips. It's a matter of the heart. You're not really convicted Christians. You're just, convic you're just Christians by convenience. We'll have no part of you in our assemblies. And for these two awful crimes... For saying the emperor does not belong in the church, and for saying that the church must be made up of holy, regenerate members, the Donatists were severely, and for many centuries, punished. This idea that the emperor should come into the church, the state should sort of have an outpost in God's kingdom, is called the Constantinian Principle. And it has been the bane of God's people throughout the ages. For centuries, the Catholic princes slew their peaceful subjects for no other crime than following the dictates of their consciences. Three words established their never-forgotten guilt, the Spanish Inquisition, in which the most exquisite devices human depravity could ever come up with were used to punish people for denying the headship of the Pope, for believing that you should read the Bible, for thinking that baptism should only be for believers, for believing the church should be made up of regenerate people rather than all the people in a given city. And so for many centuries, adopting the principle that the state has its place in the church, Catholic princes throughout the ages slew their peaceful subjects. Protestants, however, are just as guilty. For in accepting this evil principle, they committed the cruelest barbarities in the name of Christ. Two Anabaptists, a man by the name of Phillips, another fellow by the name of Manns, were drowned in Zurich, Switzerland, with the consent of Holy Ulrich Zwingli. Michael Servetus, the anti-Trinitarian heretic, went to the stake in Calvin's Geneva. The Episcopalians hunted down and murdered the Scottish Covenanters, cutting off their heads and putting them way up on the top of a pike, high so that everyone can see. And even the American Puritans, to whom we're so in, uh, indebted 
whipped Obadiah Holmes, who was a mere Baptist preacher, for the glory of God. At this point, I have to tell you, the blood of the martyrs is crying to me to vindicate them in your hearing. So let me do it. Any church which accepts the Constantinian principle, which would bring the state alongside the church to do its will, would depend upon the state, would dispense with spiritual weapons and go over to carnal weapons, is nothing less than mystery. Babylon, the great mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth, the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And so what did Constantine do as head of the church? He decreed orthodoxy. He punished heretics. Thirdly, he made hypocrites. A coerced faith is no faith at all. Constantine's favors, therefore, rather than enriching the church with members, only corroded it with hypocrites. It was therefore a total failure. It is not one of numbers, mused the old Puritan, but one of holiness that hinders the church. To show how he used brute force in matters of faith, I need only again refer to the Council of Nicaea. Remember I told you the two main figures were Arius and Athanasius. At the end of the trial, Constantine said, well, Athanasius is right and Arius is wrong. Now, the Arian bishops weren't all that pleased with his decision, so they said, well, we're not going to follow your decree. And so, being a typical worldling, he called in his bodyguard, and several, several rough troops came there and pointed swords at them, and they said, we think you're going to obey the emperor. And they said, yes, sir, we deny the Arian heresy, and we accept the Athanasian doctrine. But let me ask you, do you think those men were really converted to the truth of Christ? Do you think that was an effective way to bind their consciences and bring them into submission to the truth that Christ is really God? I think not. And so in bringing the state into the church for all of his fine gifts, in fact, Constantine did nothing but destroy the church by sowing discord from within. The most he could do was to create orthodoxy and the principle once accepted can lead to the greatest disasters All he could do was punish heretics, and because God's people are not of this world, they will always be the heretics in comparison to the worldlings. And the best he could do for the world was make hypocrites out of people, forcing them to confess what they never believed, and giving them a sense of security while on their way to perdition. So that was the legacy of Constantine, and a very sad one it is. But now let me close today. With a, few, with a few remarks that I hope will make the life and work of Constantine of some practical value to us. First of all, we must resist all state intrusion into matters spiritual. For it was Constantine, not Christ, who brought the state into the church. At the present time, the chief areas of intrusion are related to children especially their discipline and schooling. How do we resist all the intrusions? Well, not by revolutionary tactics, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We only do so by spiritual weapons, especially prayer and the willingness to suffer as a Christian, if it be the will of God. To do any less is to agree with the pagans of old and admit, after all, Caesar is Lord. So the history of Constantine encourages us to resist all state intrusion into matters spiritual. But this cannot be achieved by the end, by the point of a sword, because whoever lives by the sword dies by the sword. It's to be achieved only by true spiritual graces, prayer and study, humility, submission to God's will. Secondly, We must resist the temptation of introducing worldly methods into the church. We must resist the temptation of introducing worldly methods into the church. As a device for increased Sunday school attendance, Constantine had a pretty good idea. Declare the state to be Christian and coerce people to go to church. But what effect did it have on the church? Ruinous. And whenever we introduce worldly methods into the church, 
for the purpose of either attracting the unbelievers or keeping people within the church, then we have fallen into the same mistake as Constantine did of old. Without going too far afield, let me say just kind of off the cuff, that you know the altar call really follows in the, in the footsteps of Constantine, doesn't it? Because it is a very effective way of bringing people into the church. That cannot be debated. Churches with altar calls can bring more people into the membership than churches without them. But what effect does it have on the church? The same effect that Constantine's sword had upon the church. It does nothing but turn the church into the world, into a baptized world. So let's be careful at all costs to resist the temptation of introducing worldly methods into the church. Thirdly, we must avoid coercion in matters of faith. Tell me, please, did Constantine's spear ever really change anyone's heart? Never. I wonder, though, if we as parents think that by putting pressure on our children to profess faith, we believe that our coercion will affect such a happy change. Always avoid coercion in matters of faith. Tell your children the gospel. Tell them how much you wish they would believe the gospel. Plead with them to receive the gospel and pray earnestly for them. But never, under any circumstances, put psychological pressure upon them to do anything. Let the Holy Spirit do His work. God calls men to preach the gospel and calls the Holy Spirit to apply it to the conscience of sinners. Beware, because if there's one thing in the world worse than a sinner, it's a sinner who believes himself to be saved. They become twofold the children of hell. So please be careful to avoid coercion in matters of faith. You know, it's strange, isn't it, that those of us who recoil at the, the cheapness of Arminianism in bringing unconverted people to church and bringing them, into the, bringing them to the faith and so forth, often apply the very same tactics to our own children. Watch out. And then fourthly and finally, beware of felt prosperity. Beware of felt prosperity, be it temporal or spiritual. It is the forerunner of disaster. The church must have leaped at the thought of official toleration and enrichment. But what 300 years of persecution could not accomplish, a few years of prosperity could. It put the light of the, the world under a bushel. This, of course, should not have surprised the early Christians before, long before it was written, but Jeshuan waxed fat and kicked. And so beware of prosperity, because it is often the forerunner of disaster. And so, the life of Constantine becomes one of the turning points in church history. It changes the whole nature of the church from a local, visible body of regenerate saints meeting for the worship of God into little more than an auxiliary of the state that has never been God's will. And it's not God's will if that auxiliary is Catholic, if it's Protestant, or if it's anything else. God alone is sovereign. And He has created this world with spheres of sovereignty. And no one sphere is allowed to reach its tentacle over to some other sphere. The state has no business ruling the church. The church has no business interfering with the state. The church has no claims upon the children of parents. Parents can put no pressure on the church. All of these things are to be separate because the fact of the matter is God alone is sovereign. And the moment we begin to consolidate the spheres which God made separate is the moment we head down the road to totalitarianism and humanism, both of which are simply forms of atheism and the worship of man. God help us to avoid such things. May God reverse what Constantine did.
May God use what he decreed in his own providence by Constantine to chasten God's people and teach them to return to the scripture and it alone. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we do deplore the fact that Constantine mixed the world and the church. But Lord, we know in doing so, he was simply fulfilling your purpose. I pray that by looking at that ugly monstrosity, we might feel the greater need to keep our church separate from all worldly entanglements. Lord, I pray that we would take up the whole armor of God and not the armor of this world. Keep us, Lord, pure from its evil influence and make us to what we ought to be, people of God, without spot, blemish, kept for the Master's use. Amen.